Let's open our Bibles tonight to the New Testament book of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6. We're talking about the King's Sermon, Worship. Jesus is in the portion of uh, the Sermon on the Mount. We saw last week in chapter 5, he was talking about righteousness. Tonight, he's going to talk about worship. And we're going to see that there are four aspects of worship that he covers. You might know, not know there's worship uh, in many different aspects, and we're going to cover four of them tonight. We're going to talk about worship in giving. As we give of our money and our time and our resources, that's worship. That's honoring God. Worship in prayer. Certainly as we pray, we are to worship the Lord. And uh, worship in fasting. Not always one of our favorite aspects of um, worship, but fasting is a matter of worshiping God. And then worship with our wealth, the resources that God gives to us. That's also a form of worship. We're going to see that our acts of worship are to honor God, not to impress man. And that is a difficult thing. When we do something really nice and extra special, we in the old nature like to have people know about it. And the Lord says, let people know about it, and you'll lose your reward from me. So with that in mind, let's ask for the Lord's help. Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word. Help us to really understand it and really learn how to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're in chapter 6. We've got 34 verses to cover, and we're going to talk, first of all, about worship in our giving. Again, he's in the middle of his teaching of the crowd uh, about righteousness in chapter 5, now about worship in chapter 6. Take heed, or be careful, that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. Assuredly, or that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Or, I think most of the texts have the word openly there. So let's talk about giving. First of all, as we are doing charitable deeds, and we're talking about money, but also could be good deeds. We're doing hospital visits, uh, we're baking uh, a pie for somebody, we're mowing their lawn, we're giving them a ride. But he says, take heed in verse 1, or be careful that you do not do your charitable deed or your good deed before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Now, he doesn't say that you can't do it before men, but you don't do it to be seen by them. Now, we have offerings. We have an offering in our service. Um, if I go to a hospital visit, there are those that I will tell about it, uh, my elder staff, so that we can pray. It doesn't mean we can't tell people what we're doing, but the motive must be not to be seen by them and approved by them, but simply to keep them in the loop to be part of what we're trying to do for the Lord. So, again, when the plate is passed uh, in a service, you put your money in, that's fine. But if you do it in a very flashy way to be seen by men, or you tell people what you've done in order to get approval, uh, that's not right. So we need to be watching our motives. Are we there to impress man, or are we there to worship God? Verse 2, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Again, it's the idea of trying to get glory and to impress man. We're not trying to get glory from man. Our charitable deeds are to be worshiping God and serving him and doing what he wants us to do. And as we do it with the right motive, we will get glory in heaven and might even get some notice uh, here on earth, but not because we're trying to seek it or get it, but because God just simply grants it. So don't sound the trumpet. 
I imagine in some cases they must have sounded a trumpet. Uh, Here's a mighty deed about to take place. They did it in the synagogues and they did it in the streets. And uh, they did it to get glory from men. Now the old nature, the human nature, does want people to know what we're doing. It's very, very hard to just do things for the Lord quietly without uh, wanting to tell somebody about it. And uh, that's a, a temptation we have to really, really watch out for. Because God says, your motive is wrong. Your motive is to get approval from man, not from me. And if you're going to do it before man, then I'm not going to reward you in heaven. Uh, so we need to be careful about that. And we need to say, Lord, help me to just be so used to serving you that I'm here to please you. And if others happen to notice it, I'm not trying to bring it before their attention that's okay, but I want to really honor you. And incidentally, sometimes God is going to allow our charitable needs to be known by man, but it's not our motive, it's not our desire, but he simply wants to get a little advertising out of it. That's his business. But here's how you do it. You you do it quietly and you do it lovingly. Verse 3, when you do a charitable deed, do not let let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So you do it so matter-of-factly and so uh, much just without any fanfare that it's almost like one hand doesn't know what the other one's doing. Uh, It's natural for you. And the more you do it, the more natural it becomes. And the more you love Jesus and the more you're worshiping Him, you don't really do it to get the satisfaction of others. You want to please Him. You want to help Him. You want to be a part of His program, which is to do good deeds for people. Jesus doesn't do it here physically on earth now. He does it through us. He wants to bless people. He wants to meet their needs. And he needs us to do it. So be so focused on Jesus that whatever you do, you do at his direction by his power and for his glory. And you'll have all sorts of rewards in heaven. And make sure, he says in verse 4, that you do your charitable deed in secret And your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Sometimes, as I mentioned, he will get some notice uh, here on uh, on earth. And sometimes not, it'll have to be at the heavenly throne. Um, We all have a tendency at times in the flesh to try to promote ourselves. But as we really let the Lord take care of promotion, uh, it's amazing what he will do. Um, I try, and I'm sure you do as well, just to do what he tells you to do every day without any fanfare, not trying to go to the newspapers or the press or the radio. But uh, when he wants uh, press, when he wants publication, he will do it. Um, not, I think it was about a year ago, I was just minding my own business one day, and I got uh, an email from uh, a newspaper person in this area. And... Um, He said, I've been asked by Albany Law School, where you uh, attended and where you graduated from, to uh, do an article on you. They're doing an article on those lawyers who went into ministry. And out of Albany Law School's thousands and thousands of graduates, uh, only four of us went into ministry, but they did an article on the four. So we had to get a photograph and we had to do all that business. Um, I wasn't looking for that. But the Lord wanted the advertising, so we went ahead and did it. And he knows how to get the word out about what you're doing for his glory. But let it be him who designs it. And the article was done nicely by this fellow, and it was to the glory of God. Um, Not long after, the uh, local newspaper, the Times Union, contacted me and said, we'd like to do an article about your ministry. So again, we invited them in. They did photographs, did the article. And uh, it was the Lord who put it together. But if I had decided to call the law school and say, hey, I've got a story you need to hear, or call the Times Union and said, you need to hear about this, that's promoting self. And that will not please God. Oh, it might get some oohs and ahs, uh, perhaps, uh, from man, but it's not going to get anything from God. So let the Lord do the promotion. All we need to do is do what we're supposed to do. He'll take care of the rest. So that's worshiping God in our giving. Let's do it quietly. Let's do it lovingly for Him and lovingly for people we want to bless. That's the first worship. Now we worship in prayer, verse 5. We know that worship in prayer should be secret, not trying to call attention to self. It should be succinct. Let's get to the point and not have babbling, vain repetition. 
It should be full prayer. Not every prayer has to be full, but the Lord's going to give us a pattern of prayer, which is quite full. And then it should be prayer that is forgiving. It forgives those who have sinned against us. So in verse 5, let's begin with secret prayer, verses 5 and 6. Jesus says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So he's talking about the attitude of the hypocrite, a pretender. A hypocrites in the Greek uh, has to do with the Greek uh, actors. You all, you've all seen the picture in theater of the smiling face, the laughter, and the sad face, you know, the drama and the comedy. And that comes from the Greek masks because they didn't have closed circuit television, they couldn't, couldn't zoom in, and the people in the audience couldn't see the actors way down on the stage. So the actors would have to put faces on so they could see them better. And so they were pretending to be a character. Um, and when you and I are not sincere, we are hypocrites, we're actors. And he says, when you pray, don't be like these actors, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. That's the critical part. Nothing wrong with standing to pray. Nothing wrong with praying on the street corner. Nothing wrong with praying in the restaurant. Uh, but not to be seen by men. Now, when you go into a restaurant uh, and you have Christians around you, there's nothing wrong with saying, let's bow our hearts before the Lord, maybe bow our heads, maybe even take hands, but just quietly without trying to call attention to self. Um, once I was in a, in a club here in Albany and uh, I noticed a party coming in. I, I knew them, they were Christians. And uh, they went over in the corner and they were talking and then it came time for the food. And don't you know, they all raised their hands. They were sitting, they had to raise their hands higher than their heads. And it was such a show and such a production. Uh, I was embarrassed um, because to me that was calling attention. I can't judge their hearts. Thank God I'm not God. But it just did not look right to me. And so uh, we need to not call attention to ourselves. I'm glad I didn't go to dinner. I would love to have spent some time with the great Smith Wigglesworth, the great evangelist out of England, but I would not want to have gone to dinner with him in a public restaurant. Uh, one day he did take a young minister with him to a restaurant and he asked the young man to pray over the meal, and he did. And he finished his prayer and Smith Wigglesworth said, young man, that's not the way you pray. He stood up and with full booming voice that filled every corner of that room, that restaurant, with people looking, he had a prayer that they all heard. Again, I'm not judging his heart, but I'm sure glad I wasn't the fellow sitting there with him because it was definitely calling attention to self. Now, was Wigglesworth trying to call attention to himself or just trying to teach and make a point? Only he and God know that. But let's make sure in our hearts that we're not trying to be seen by men, but simply to bless our Father. Worship is between us and God. Incidentally, the word worship, I did a little quick research uh, before we came out tonight. Uh, the word worship is uh, coming from the Greek word which means it's proskuneo, and it means to prostrate yourself. Uh, in the Greek, interestingly, it's the word that's used for animal lovers uh, of a dog licking the hand. When a dog licks your hand, that is the closest the Greeks could understand to the idea of worship. So when you're praying, it's like you're licking God's hand. Uh, to the Persians and those in the East, it was the idea of getting on your knees and putting your head down to the ground. You've probably seen Muslims do this on television or in person. And it's the idea of bowing and worshiping. Uh, the word worship in the English comes from the Old English word worth-ship, to acknowledge the worth of the one that you are worshiping. So we're worshiping God. Worshiping God in our giving, worshiping God in our prayer, and our prayer should be secret, not just to be seen by men. Again, you're in a prayer meeting, no problem at all in praying in front of the others, no problem in praying in front of the congregation. 
but what is the motive? That's the key thing. It's not the act, it's the attitude. No harm in praying on the street corner. No harm in praying in church or in the synagogue. No harm in standing in prayer. No harm in speaking before thousands in prayer. But what is the motive? Are you trying to be seen by men or are you trying to be seen by God? When I would lead worship here in the church for a good part of our church life over the years, um, it's a temptation we all have to fight to make sure that you're keeping your eyes on the Lord. And I used to have a little thing that I would do for myself that nobody could see. If I began to get pay attention to my voice, my voice sounds a little better than usual today. My voice doesn't sound so good. My voice this, my voice that. Uh, so the congregation couldn't see it. I would just simply take my finger and move it in the upward position like that, meaning get your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes off yourself. Just go vertical. So when we are beginning to think too much about ourselves and not about God and not about others, that's, that's wrong. Now, he says, when you pray, verse 6, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You don't have to always go into a room and shut the door. He's trying to make a point. In other words, prayer is private, it is secret, and you want to make sure that you're not doing it in front of others to impress others. But it's a private thing, but again, there's no harm in having public prayer if, again, it's you and the Lord and bringing those people before the Lord. It's not an easy thing for us to do. We are so aware of other people, but we have to be thinking about God. Verse 7, and when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. He wants for us to be succinct. And I did a little bit of research and some other translations on vain repetitions. Uh, it means to be babbling. It doesn't, it mean, vain means it's empty. Now there's nothing wrong with saying, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. If you really mean it and you're making a point. But if you're just simply kind of stuck in neutral because you're thinking about Hawaii and you're thinking about this and that and you're just babbling, I love you, Lord, and it's a nice day and thank you. For, you've got to get yourself focused. It's just like with human beings. Uh, you talk to somebody, you want to make sure they're paying attention to you. And if they're just babbling and they're not paying attention to you, you say, hey, focus, focus. And God says, I want you to focus. You're talking to the one who's omniscient, the one who knows all things and who stands outside of time and limitation. He knows what you're going to pray for before you pray. So be succinct and be focused and be concentrating on him. And as far as being succinct, not only does God like it, but guess what? Everybody else around you does as well. We used to have a young man in our church who was the, whose father was a pastor here. And uh, this was many, many years ago, and um, he used to, uh, at the kitchen table, when the father was about to pray for grace, he'd say, Dad, please don't start in Genesis. And I think that was a pretty clever way of saying here, let's get to the point. Uh, I have had people bless food in my presence, and um, it goes on and on and on, and I think to myself, and also, Lord, thank you for the food. We never did get to that point. So uh, it means vain repetition means you're just babbling. You're just, you're just talking, and God is worthy of our best. You wouldn't do that to somebody else. Don't do it to God. Be pointed, and I like to think about the idea of a flare prayer. You know what a flare prayer is? A flare is like sending up a flare whoosh, like that. Uh, can you imagine Peter walking on the Sea of Galilee, looking at the waves, going towards Jesus, starting to sink beneath the waves. And now, O oh God, who made the heavens and the earth and all the seas and all that are in them, the omnipotent God who was with Israel, by that time he'd be at the bottom of the lake, wouldn't he? So what did he just say? Lord, save me. I love a flare prayer. Boom, that's it. Uh, we have a prayer list here. We have a prayer team of well over 260 families in about eight nations, and it's just growing by the day. It's about 19, 20 states now. And um, I was talking to somebody, um, or actually he just emailed me. He said, I cannot imagine the hours that you must spend in prayer with this uh, ministry. Well, there's administration to be sure, but I said, I don't spend a lot of time in prayer. Really? I said, oh, no. No, I said, I'm the master of the flare prayer. Person needs cancer healed. Lord, heal that cancer. 
in Jesus' name. That's it. I don't need to go into all the cells and all the this and the that. God's waiting to just, just looking for the faith. And when the faith is there, you just go for it. So if you need to take longer, that's fine. But I have found this in my life and in the lives of others. There is an inverse proportion, inverse proportion to the length of the prayer and the amount of faith. The more faith in my life and I think in others, the more faith, the less time we spend in prayer. The less faith, the more time we spend in prayer because people are trying to get themselves warmed up. They're trying to build their faith. They're trying to get themselves oriented towards God. When you're zoned in on the Lord and you're there, it doesn't take long to say, Lord, take care of this in Jesus' name or just Jesus. In fact, when you see patterns of prayer with Jesus and his apostles and disciples, it's amazing the number of times that Jesus and his disciples healed without ever opening their mouths. Never even opened their mouths. Jesus, much of the time, did not open his mouth at all in prayer. He would lay his hand on somebody. He'd just say, go. He'd take some spit and put it in mud and put clay on the person's eyes, touch the person's tongue. Uh, it's the faith. It's not the words. And you can have faith without uttering words at all or very few words. So let's keep it succinct. And uh, he says, they think they'll be heard by their many words. The more words I give, the more God's going to pay attention to me. Not, no, he's, he's not looking for volume. He's looking for quality. He's looking for the faith. Faith as a grain of mustard seed. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. That's an important principle, and I think about that often. God, here's a great revelation. You have no idea what I'm going to be talking about, and you have no idea about this situation, and I must now educate you. Nonsense. He knows about it before I even speak. So he knows all about the problem. He knows about the solution. So I need to just plug in and say, thank you, Lord. In fact, we're going to see the pattern of prayer here, how little time Jesus spends in petitioning and how much time he spends in praising that's also an inverse proportion. I'm into algebra or something tonight, I guess. Uh, the more time we spend praising God, the less time we're going to spend petitioning God. The more you praise God, the bigger God becomes in your mind, the bigger your faith becomes, the more trust and confidence you have, the less time you're going to spend in trying to convince him to do what you want to have him do. In fact, you'll be spending more time just getting in mind with what he has in mind, and you're going to know he's going to take care of it. And so the more time we spend in praise, the less time we're going to petition. The less time we praise, the more we're going to petition. Here is a pattern of prayer. It's been called the Lord's Prayer. It's also been called the Disciples' Prayer. It is not a prayer that has to be said, but it's a pattern of prayer. It's an example, and it's perfect. And I'm saying here that this is a full prayer and an example for us to pray fully. Verse 9, in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation. But deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we all know that prayer, and there's no harm in praying that prayer. And there's also no harm in not praying that prayer, but simply learning by example some wonderful principles. And we're going to talk about some of those principles. Um, it's often been called a praise sandwich. You know, a sandwich with two pieces of bread and the meat or whatever is in between. So we open with praise and we close with praise and we have so much in between. One of the principles, I think, in prayer is let's not forget about worshiping God. Let's not get so fast into the gimme, gimme, gimme's that we don't think about God and his program and his plan. If we are here to serve him, Let's not forget to talk about that aspect of his needs and his desire and his program in our prayer. So let's begin. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. So he starts off by addressing our Father, inclusive for all who are there who are believers. He's in heaven, and it's good to think about God being in heaven. There's an old saying that you find in some churches, he sits high and he looks low. He's up there, he's got a great perspective. Get up in an airplane, and you've got a better perspective than you do right here on the ground. When you're up in heaven, he sees it all. Not only that he's got a better view because he's higher, but right now he can see the world being created. He can see the new heaven and new earth. He sees me being born at this moment. He sees me now at my age. He sees me passing on. He sees it all. So he's in heaven. Know that he has the perspective that you and I don't have. Hallowed be your name. Holy be your name. And also, Lord, may I treat your name as holy, and may I represent you to others as being holy. Your kingdom come. Oh, we haven't gotten to our need yet, have we? Your kingdom come. Let's talk about you first, Lord. Your kingdom come. The millennial kingdom when Jesus returns. Jesus coming into my life today with the fullness of his kingdom. Your kingdom come, and your will be done. Oh, that pleases God. Let's get our eyes on His will before we get our eyes on our will. What is your plan, Lord? And may it come to fulfillment. We're also going to find that as we pray for His kingdom to come and His will to be done, it's going to answer a lot of our needs right there because His desire is to bring His program into our lives. And much of what we want to talk about is really what He wants to have for us anyway. So as you pray for Him and His kingdom and His will, then you're going to see a lot of it fulfilled in your own life. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, God's will is absolutely supreme and perfect in heaven, isn't it? Not so much on the earth, not so much in my life, and not so much in the lives of others. Lord, I want your plan. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us today what we need. Not just me, but us. And let's be inclusive with others around us. That's his petition. It's sandwiched so small that you can hardly see it. Give us this day our daily bread. Whatever I need today, not tomorrow. Many of our problems are because we can't figure out what he's going to give us tomorrow. Uh, I have enough for today, but I don't have enough for tomorrow or the day after. And so I'm worried about that. No, the Israelites had to learn that with the manna coming down, didn't they? They were trying to, in some cases, garner up more than they were supposed to. God rained down bread while they walked through the wilderness, and they were supposed to have enough for that day. And they began to hoard it up, because if I can hoard up enough for tomorrow, then I don't need to trust God for tomorrow. No, God didn't uh, allow that. He turned it into worms. So, or he made worms destroy the bread. So I need enough for today, Lord, and I'll be grateful for that. And then forgive us our debts. I'm a debtor to you, Lord. I have sinned. We're talking about sin. When we sin, we owe God something because of that. What we actually owe is our lives. We actually owe our blood because the soul who sins shall surely die, Scripture says. So, Lord, forgive me for my debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive me as I forgive my debtor. That really means to the same degree. Lord, forgive me all of my sins, and I'll forgive my neighbor some of his sins. It's not going to work that way. Forgive me, Lord, everything as I forgive everybody else everything is what he's really saying. And he'll come back and talk about that matter of forgiveness, and he'll let us know that if we don't forgive others, God's not going to forgive us. And none of us can afford that, can we? We have to have his forgiveness. So he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. What does that mean, don't lead me into temptation? Are we saying that if we get into temptation, it's God's fault? God led us into temptation? That's not right, is it? Common sense tells us that's not the case. And James tells us that God is the one who... He may test us, but he never tempts us. It's the devil who tempts us. It's our old nature that tempts us, but not God. So 
do not allow me to be led into temptation is what it really means. Lord, there are forces out there. There's the world. There's the devil. There's my old nature trying to lead me into temptation. Help me not to succumb to that. And deliver me from the evil one because he's the one who is trying to, as Jesus said to Peter, sift you like wheat. Satan is trying to sift us like wheat. And then he closes with prayer. Get your eyes right back on the Lord. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Period. We could spend years on this one prayer, and we certainly can't do that tonight. But again, I want to open up with praise. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's get into the petition for God's will. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's my petition, not just mine, but for everybody. Give us this day our daily bread, whatever we need today. We get specific with God, and that's fine. But hey, you, you prayed about the car, you prayed about the mortgage, you prayed about health, you prayed about the cat and the dog and sis and cousin, that's fine. But if you forgot some things, do you think God's going to forget you? No, he'll take care of those needs as well as you're walking with him. And then he wants to make sure that this matter of forgiveness has been taken care of because God won't hear us in our sins. We need to confess them. And so forgive us our debts or our sins as we forgive our debtors and enable me to be able to forgive others. And don't lead us into temptation. Don't let me be tempted. I want to be pure and holy. Keep me from the evil one. And again, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. It's all about you, Lord. It's not my reputation. It's you. Uh, it's your kingdom. It's your power and it's your glory. Now, I'll go back over this prayer one more time, and this is where it gets really exciting. One of the best books I ever read was Small, and that was a qualifier for me. I like small books. This was a tiny little thing, uh, uh, just a little eight, five by eight kind of a booklet, and it was called Alone with God. I'm not even sure you could find it. You might try to Google that, Alone with God. And it was written by a fellow who taught me a wonderful principle, not new to him and probably not new to you. It was to me at the time. And that was using this prayer, taking each of these phrases and applying it first to yourself, then to your immediate family, then to your church, then to your local community, then to your nation, then to the world. Talk about exploding prayer. For example, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May I really manifest the holiness of your name. My wife, may she do so. My kids, may my friend, my next door neighbor manifest it. May my pastor, the church, the elders, the local city council, the judges, the president, you get the idea. And you just go right on down to this prayer. Your kingdom come. May your kingdom come in reality, in power in my life today. May your kingdom come to my school teacher. May your kingdom come to the young lady up at the corner of mobile station that she might be able to see the power of God in her life. And that neighbor who's cranky and that person who's difficult and that person on television who represents the opposite party, may that person know the kid. Just expand it. Self, family, church, community, nation, the world. And you'll find your prayer life is exploding and your perspective is getting much wider. And the, the more you spend time on God and his needs and his program and who he is and the needs of others, the less time you'll spend about yourself and you'll be mightily blessed. What would happen if we got so into praising God, so into praying for others and their blessings that we forgot to pray for our own needs? You think God would say, you stupid jerk. You didn't mention your needs, therefore forget you. I'm not going to bless you. I think God would still take care of our needs. There have been times when I've said to him, Lord, you know far better than I what I need. It's, I'm just yours. Take care of me. I'll spend my time praising you. Try that. It'll really, really work. I need to try it more. All right, everything sounds fine. But the inquiring mind says, wait a minute, what is this forgiveness thing? Forgive me my debts or our debts as we forgive our, 
I don't like that. I like to be forgiven, but I got a couple of grudges. And I'm telling you, I've got some issues. Now, we've all got this. Now, I come from the hills of Tennessee. That's where I was born. You know all about the Hatfields and the McCoys and the, fe- the fuss and feuding down that way. Well, guess what? I'm here at Albany, and they've got Hatfields and McCoys here. They've got them all over. Uh, they're, we all have our grudges. And I deal with it all the time, and I have people that have to deal with it as well. So let's go back to this matter of forgiveness. Verse 14, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's good. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Uh Uh-oh. Did I read that right? If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's what he's saying. Unforgiveness is sin. God will not bless sin. So we need to check our hearts. If somebody comes to you and says, please forgive me, you must, must, must forgive. You must release that debt. That person is saying, I'm indebted to you. I need to be released of that debt. And you must do it. But if there are a thousand people in my lives, in my life who have offended me. How many do you think have come to me and asked forgiveness in a hypothetical? Out of a thousand people, I'm sure a hundred is too big a number. I'm sure 50 is too big a number. Maybe 10 out of a thousand have come and said, forgive me. What about the other 950? I don't need to forgive them because they did not ask me. So therefore I can keep my unforgiveness. It's not the issue my unforgiveness will still block God's forgiving me. I must forgive them, even though they don't come to me and ask forgiveness, because if I don't forgive them, God will not forgive me. All right, I'm off the hook if somebody has died, right? I've got a grandparent who abused me, or I've got a cousin who abused me or did something wrong and offended me, so therefore I'm entitled to have unforgiveness toward that person and I can't go and even talk about it because that person's dead. So I'm entitled to harbor unforgiveness for somebody who offended me and that person's dead. Right? Wrong. Because it's still unforgiveness and it's still going to block God's forgiving me. So I must forgive that person. How do you do it? Well, Even in the secular world, the psychologists will tell you and the group therapists will tell you, write a letter, do something like that. You can write a letter to that person who's dead. You can speak to that person who's dead and say so and so, I forgive you for what you have done. And it's even permissible to say, God, I'm having trouble forgiving, but I give you permission to forgive through me because we must forgive, pray for it and ask God to give you that grace because Jesus has forgiven us everything. And we must. And the Lord talks a lot about this forgiveness thing. We'll talk about it as we go on through Matthew. So we do not want God not to forgive us. All right, what about fasting? We love to talk about fasting, don't we? Oh, I love my meals. I hate to miss a meal. Verse 16, moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So again, you're not trying to please people or impress people. You're trying to please God. So in fasting, you do it joyfully. You don't have that sad countenance. You know, people can pick up on you. You walk around and say, hi, how are you? This is Pastor Jerry. What's wrong, Pastor? Oh, that's okay. I'm just a little weak because I haven't had any food. I'm, you see, I'm on a three-day fast. Ooh, how spiritual you are. Years ago, I went to a service down in Florida, and there was the first service of the new year, and the pastor said, well, as always here at so-and-so church, we fast, and I'm in the middle of a seven or 14 day fast. I'm thinking, careful buddy, you're going to lose that reward. And he couldn't stop talking about that fast. I may seem a little weak to you tonight or today, and I might not have the strength and the energy, but I am fasting. And so therefore, please, and I thought, oh my golly, I just, you just wasted that fast as far as glorifying uh, 
uh, uh, coming forth from heaven. You're just all doing it before man to impress man. God's not going to be impressed with that. I felt like saying, shut your mouth, fella, and get some credit for this fast. Because nobody likes to fast, and it's a real sacrifice. But um, when you do it, do it joyfully. Don't you know, dis- disguise the fact that, that you're, you're, you just show the joy of the Lord because God's going to bless you for a fast that has the right motive. And then um, make sure you do it secretly, verse 17. But when you do fast, anoint your head, wash your face, get up and be normal, in other words, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who's in the secret place. Act normal in front of other people. God knows you're fasting. That's all that counts. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And you're, why are you fasting? That's another thing. Why do you fast? I was taught in my early days to fast to move the hand of God. What a lot of nonsense that was. That's not why you fast. I'm going to fast so I can get God to do what I want him to do. That's not right. I'm going to fast to worship God, to draw closer to him, to have a listening ear so I can hear what he wants for my life. I can become conformed into his image more and more. I want to be more like him. I want to grow spiritually. And as I have to deny myself physical food, I want to then feed myself spiritually. And if you are going to fast, may I suggest that you don't sit there and fast by watching the movies or reading the funny papers. Uh, The time that you would be eating, 15, 20 minutes, whatever, spend that time in the Word. I'm depriving myself of physical food and even beverage, perhaps, and I'm going to now nourish myself in God's Word. And then don't tell others about it unless you have to for some reason. Uh, How about going out to dinner? No, thanks. Why not? Well, you can say I'm fasting. Just explain it. But do it to impress God uh, in the sense that you love him and you want to put him first. So, so, So fasting is joyful and it's secret. Finally, it's wealth. What about our wealth? And that's a tough one for us, maybe the hardest thing, because God gives most all of us, by his grace, the ability to go out and earn a living. Uh, and to get wealth or to get uh, supply. And what are we going to do with it? We work hard for our money, and we think it's ours. And we can do with it as we want to or as we think we ought to. Uh, And God says, not really, because I have given you wealth to be used for my direction, not your own. Let's see what he says about this beginning in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the very first principle he has about worshiping in wealth is to worship wisely. Use wealth wisely. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. The operative word is for yourselves. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now, there's no harm to having a savings program. I was trying to work with a longtime Christian this last week about that. Uh, Again, it's by email. He's in a different state, but he's always needing money for this and that and can't afford this and that. And I lovingly pointed out we might want to start working on a savings program uh, because, you know, he said, I just trust God. My wife and I just trust God and we trust him. He always meets the needs. And I felt like saying, yeah, he's meeting the needs through me. (laughs) And so what you need to do is save money. And I sent him the proverb about the ant. Go to the ant, you sluggard, because in the harvest, the ant lays up something for the winter. So we need to be able to set aside something. Yes, we put the first tenth into God. He talks about that in the Bible. The first tenth of every dollar, it belongs to God. That's called tithing. That's returning to him. He also has offerings, and he directs us on how to have extra offerings for this and that. But he also wants us to have a responsible savings program because if we don't, then we're going to become a burden to somebody else. We can't always have harvest. We're not always going to be able to work. There'll be times when there's downtime for sickness or for this or that, or we lose a job and we need to be able to then uh, find the right job instead of jumping to the first thing that we look for. 
We need to have a responsible savings program. If we don't, we'll be a burden to somebody else. And we're supposed to be, according to Paul, having enough for our own needs and enough for every good work. I want to be able to bless others, not be a burden to others, should be the attitude. Well, don't lay it up for yourself. And of course, they didn't have banks and money uh, as we do now. Uh, they had coins, but not a savings program and no banking programs or CDs or investments. Uh, your money was on your back in rich garments um, or in the things that you had, silver, gold, fine garments. And so you leave it down here and it's going to rust and it's going to decay and it's going to have moths eat it. Uh, and uh, if not, then the thieves are going to come on in and steal it on you. But what you want to do is lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How do you do that? You see, in heaven, moth and rust aren't going to destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How do you lay up with your wealth? We're talking about your dollars talking about other resources like your energy. As you get older, don't you agree that your energy is real wealth? When you feel good, that's a, that's a wonderful wealth. When you don't feel good, you realize you're missing it. But how do you lay it up in heaven? There's another way of putting it. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. How do you do that? All right, here's my dollar. The first tenth, that's a no-brainer, the first tenth is the tithe that belongs to God. I've got a mortgage, and I've got a car payments, and I've got kids' education, and I've got food, and what have you, and I do a little budget, and I want to put something aside for savings, but I want to also be able to bless the kingdom of God, because God wants us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature, and that's going to take money. So here's the tenth that belongs to God, and now I'm going to take another 5%. And that's going to be my offering. And I'm going to give that 10, 5% to God's work. I'll take it to my church for perhaps another uh, place that God directs me to do it. Now, I'm giving 15%. And that 15%, that 10% is God's, 5% I'm offering on top of that. Where's that going to go? That's going to go to run a church, run a ministry, radio, television, Bibles, missionaries, what have you. Is that blessing heaven? Is that sending it on ahead? When you and I are at the, the judgment seat of Christ and God's giving out rewards, you're going to see that 5% helped feed some orphans in Mozambique. That 5% helped some missionaries in Somaliland. That 5% helped the radio program. And 150 people came to Christ because of that. And so you're going to see that that money is now being used for eternal benefit. That'll have eternal, eternal rewards. Treasures in heaven. Verse 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So the eye really becomes that lamp to the soul, doesn't it? Eye is a term really for your perspective, how you see things. Uh, it can be your literal eye, but it can also be your, your attitude. And when your eye is good, that means it's healthy, then your whole being is healthy. And when your eye is unhealthy, then it's not healthy. So wealth needs to be uh, healthy in the sense that, Lord, I want to use this money to glorify your kingdom. Again, I have needs. I have a mortgage. I've got kids, education. I've got this and that. You know that. But, Lord, not only is the first tenth or the tithe yours, but I consider the 90% to be left over to be yours as well. So I'm going to ask you to show me how to use that 90%. Yeah, to pay the mortgage, yeah, to pay the education, etc. But it's by your direction, not mine. I don't have any money and don't want any money to do my thing with it. All of it's yours. Just show me how to use it for the kingdom, for my needs, for blessing others, and God will be blessing us. That's a healthy attitude. Me, me, me is not healthy. You, 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 God, and others, 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 that's healthy. Me, unhealthy. You and others, healthy. So that's the lamp of the body. I want to have a healthy perspective, God. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. 
You cannot serve God and mammon or wealth or riches. Mammon is an Aramaic term, and it, it was actually a god worshipped by the Philistines, and they worshipped wealth. And I wonder in our hearts how many of us worship wealth. And it doesn't necessarily mean really rich people. Worshiping wealth can be among the poor as well. And I've known, I've known folks who just didn't have two nickels to rub together, and they just worshiped wealth. It was all about the money. And so we need to have an attitude of being healthy and saying, wealth is given by God to us to be used some for our needs, and the rest really for his purposes, which also includes our needs. But wealth becomes a God. And as we are working at the office, and as we're making income, and we're making, uh, we work that job, or a second job, or a third job, uh, and sometimes today, unfortunately, we have to work two and three jobs. But it always must be with the attitude that, Lord, you are my God, not the job, and not the money. Um, and so this wealth that comes can become a God in and of itself. So we need to be able to uh, be trusting and uh, we need to have a healthy attitude. And when we begin to think about money more than God or that the money belongs to us and not to God, that's not healthy. And so we, we, we can handle that. We, we know how to, how to really tell. When my dollar comes in, and I look at that dollar, that tells me who's my God. And I think one of the great things about tithing is not only does God tell us to do that to fuel his kingdom for the expenses of his kingdom, but it shows me who my God is. If I can't give him that first tenth, which he says in Leviticus belongs to him, I've got an issue. I've got a problem. I've got a God on the other end who's not Jehovah. It's mammon. I cannot give him my 10%, that belongs to me. I need that for this expense and that. I can't afford to tithe, I can't make the expenses now. Of course you can't, because you're not putting God first. In fact, when your dollar comes into your pocket and you're gonna spend it for yourself, you got a lot of competing factors out there. The devil wants your dollar. He'll try to get that sucked up through drugs and alcohol and pornography and what have you. The world wants your dollar. Oh, they're out there advertising on billboards and all over television, radio. They want your dollar. The Lord tells us that if we don't honor him with that tenth, according to Haggai, he's going to put holes in our bucket and we're not going to be able to use that money as we want to. So let's be wise and make sure that God is our God and give him that first tenth. And that shows that mammon is not going to be your God. And then he says, don't worry. That's our final point here. Wealth should be exercised with trust. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? That means 18 inches in your height. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, or the unbelievers. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So we are not to worry. When we have wealth, there's a temptation to worry. How much wealth will keep us from worrying? The great John D. Rockefeller, great in terms of having lots of money, was once asked that question, Mr. Rockefeller, how much is enough money? And he wisely said, just a little bit more. 
And that's the attitude. There is no real security. If the security is going to be in wealth, it's never going to bring forth security, not to mention happiness, not to mention spirituality. But don't worry about your life. God makes us. He knows what we need. And he takes examples from nature. And he says, you look at the birds of the air. They're busy as can be. And God's taking care of them. Now, my four dogs leave some dog food at the end of each night, and I take it out and I feed the birds. In the wintertime, the crows are there to get their feed, and then the crows move on around March or early April, and then other animals come and they get it. Uh, they're all working. They're not on welfare. I'm not, if you're on welfare, I'm not criticizing you, but do what you can if you possibly can to get off of it. But they're all busy. They're working. And I have to say, I see squirrels dead on the road, as you do, and I see them die. I'm in the woods four times a day, so I see animals die. But I've got to say, I've never seen an animal dead, dead from starvation. They're either natural causes, or they were hit by something, or attacked by something. But I've never seen a, a squirrel, or a chipmunk, or, um, any, or even a skunk. I've never seen them malnourished and die from that. Uh, God provides for them, but other causes take them over. I've never seen a person who starved to death who upon examination was a tither. And we could say this person loved God, but he starved to death because he gave his first tenth to God or he gave additional offerings as God directed. So don't worry about these things. God takes care of animals. He takes care of lilies, beautiful flowers. You walk out in the woods right now, it's April here in Albany, and I see these little flowers popping up, uh, little buttercups and things that probably nobody sees but a few travelers on that trail. But God makes them so beautiful, far more than you and I can with our fancy clothes. And um, they'll be there for a couple of days. I've seen beautiful flowers and lilies right in the, in the woods, and they're there for a couple of days, and then they're gone. But God makes them. He knows how to take care of them. He knows how to take care of us. So the important thing is let's not worry about wealth or provision. Verse 33 is the answer. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Be busy caring about God. What is your program? Get up in the morning and say, Lord, what's your plan? What's your program? How can I please you? How can I worship you and acknowledge your worth? And I want to take care of your plan and your program and your righteousness. You take care of my needs. You know what I need. And don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow is going to worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Tomorrow is going to have troubles. Today has troubles. Why would you want to borrow tomorrow's troubles in addition to today's? Take today's troubles, bring them to the Lord, let him provide for them. Tomorrow will take care of itself. So worship is, is giving. Worship is prayer, worship is fasting, and worship is wealth. May we do it to please God, not to please man. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Father, we're grateful for this chance to have studied Matthew chapter 6 and talk about worship. Help us, Lord, to be giving quietly and lovingly, not to please others, but to please you. Help us in our prayers to do it secretly and even succinctly, full prayer and prayer that always forgives others. As we fast, Lord, help us to do it joyfully and secretly. And as we are worshiping with our wealth, may it be done wisely and in a healthy manner, putting you first and always trusting in you to meet our needs. May our acts of worship honor you, Lord, not impress men. We love you. We praise you. Help us to be worshiping people always. In Jesus' name, amen.